from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, in the UK, excuse me. And he's going to be talking about acoustic emissions as an NDT technique to predict the load carrying capacity of beams. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is work undertaken by uh, <coughs> my co-author, Sabrina Colombo, who did a PhD on this topic, um, acoustic emission evaluation of concrete bridge beams. Uh, Sabrina is now working with Faber Monsell in Birmingham. But her PhD project was sponsored by the Highways Agency in London, so I want to uh, recognize their financial contribution to the project. Uh, I also should mention that many other people have sponsored work in the university, and it's important that we, uh, we recognize all our funders. And over an extended period, period of time, the Highways Agency have been sponsoring NDE work, and that's now written up as BA86, and it's... Um, freely available on the website of uh, highways.gov.uk. So if you look at highways.gov.uk, then you can see this document, BA86. It doesn't include the acoustic emission work we're talking about, but it includes quite a lot of early work. So that's uh, highways.gov.uk. Uh, and then a whole lot of people have worked on this over the years, uh, many, uh, many students, and you'll know some of the names, and these are some of the uh, members of staff who've worked on it. So the history behind this is that the bridge stock in the UK is ageing, and the highways agency were responsible for main trunk road bridges as opposed to the uh, non-trunk road bridges or the county bridges, and you have the same kind of distinction in the US, I guess. If you take the, the main trunk roads, then they're mainly concrete bridges. Whereas if you go to the uh, county roads, then they're mainly uh, masonry arch bridges. But sticking with the trunk roads, the motorways and what have you, then the typical age profile is 25 to 35 years old. And in the US, I guess it's maybe another 10 years older. <coughs> You're probably looking at, what, 35 to 45 years old for your US bridges. So the problems that you're encountering in the US, we're starting to encounter in the UK. Uh, of course, you've got uh, more adverse climate conditions than we've got in the UK at times. I know it seems pretty cold all the time in, uh, in Scotland, but uh, it's not as bad as parts of the US. Well, the Highways Agency were interested to see if there was some means of non-destructively uh, evaluating a bridge which looked as though it was beyond its sell-by date. Um, the, the, the Prime Minister does not warm to the fact that we have lo lane closures in the Greater London area, and there are stories of his uh, Jaguar car being caught in traffic jams due to lane closures, and he doesn't warm to that at all. So uh, um, they were interested in funding this uh, uh, risky project in scientific terms, and you're familiar with acoustic emission work where you have an acoustic emission sensor and there's some source of uh, cracking or, or behavior in the structure which then is recorded as a compression wave or P wave on the uh, sensor and then you do some kind of signal processing with it. So that's the, uh, the simplest of analyses. And we were working initially on this with Mitsuhiro Shigeishi from Kumamoto University in Japan. And uh, Shigi Ishii and his colleague, uh, Professor Oates, were looking at, at different aspects of the waveform. So they were trying to undertake a, a more uh, sophisticated analysis than, than, than the ones we'd undertaken. And at the same time, we generated interest from pure technologies who have developed the sound print technique, which has been primarily used to detect wire breaks in unbonded... Um, post-tensioned uh, structures. That came from the uh, parking garages in uh, Calgary, and then it's extended on, and I think the sound print system is now being used on the Watergate Centre, where the Watergate Centre was uh, refurbished, and to cut down the cost of the refurbishment, the areas where the tendons, the, the post-tensioning, was not renewed, then that was monitored with sound print. So 
it's pretty extensively recognized as a very powerful technique for looking at unbonded post-tensioned uh, structures. So we use this sound print system along with the Physical Acoustics Corporation's Mistras system. And we also, we get lots of visitors going through the, the, the labs in Edinburgh, and this is the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the back of a couple of network rail bridge engineers. This is now moving on to Sabrina Colombo's PhD work, and uh, since she's not available to be here today, at least I've got a mugshot of her. And this is her receiving a certificate uh, for one of the uh, young uh, uh, graduate presenters at uh, BAM in Berlin. And there's the beam she's testing in the uh, structures lab in Edinburgh using one of the Meccano set frames that you bolt to the floor. And it's got um, a simply supported beam with uh, two-point loading. And we've got uh, the physical acoustics, acoustic emission transducers and also the much larger uh, sound print transducers on the uh, structure. And this is the, some photographs taken from her PhD thesis uh, showing the failure patterns of the, of the beams. We also do our very best not to damage the transducers. Uh, transducers are more valuable than students in this world, but don't tell her that. Okay, and these are some of the crack patterns that she um, uh, marked up a very uh, thorough and very, very careful researcher. And then we uh, sent um, Sabrina to uh, uh, Kumamoto University in Japan for three months to work with Mitsuhiro Shigeishi. And she did her very best to learn Japanese before she went. And she certainly did much better than I did last week when I was in uh, Kyoto. And this is the uh, uh, technician or laboratory manager, as you would call him in, Jap in uh, USA, the, the chief technician preparing the concrete beams in Kumamoto. And she reckoned he was so good and so hard working, she just wanted to put him in the suitcase and bring him back to Edinburgh. Uh, anyway, th th that was the idea to show you that we really were trying to do some international collaboration. And these were the failure, uh, th so that's the beam under test in um, Kumamoto using slightly different acoustic emission sensors, not using sound print in uh, Kumamoto. And that's the loading, a slightly different loading uh, arrangement in Kumamoto. And then we also did some work at the Transport Research Laboratory in the UK. And this lab would be the equivalent of the uh, Turner Fairbanks lab at um, Federal Highways in McLean in Virginia. And there, the idea was they would test bespoke beams, but you, you know how the laboratories get uh, privatized. So in fact, the, um, uh, we, we were testing beams that were being tested on another contract. So they were kind of doubling up on the work. But nonetheless, it was quite interesting. They had the sound print uh, transducers. And then we, we, we uh, it's the royal we, Sabrina Colombo did all the work. I would fly in for the day, see what she was up to, and then fly back to Edinburgh again and leave Sabrina to do the real work. So th she set up the, the physical acoustics uh, acoustic emission transducers on these beams. Running in parallel with this, we uh, dabbled in another area. We were working with the geophysics uh, department in Edinburgh with a, one of the professors, Ian Main, and he's been working on the Gutenberg-Richter formula and developing an analysis from this called the B-value analysis. And basically, if you calculate the B-value uh, from the failure mechanism, you can work out, um, depending upon what the value is, if it's between, say, 1 and 1 1.2, it implies that the channel that you're looking at, the sensor, is very near to a large crack, and that macro cracks are forming. When it's between 1.2 and 1.7, then that tends to indicate that there's uniformly distributed cracking. In other words, the macro cracks are not forming, they're now constant. And when the B value is greater than 1.7, this indicates that micro cracks are dominant and uh, the macro cracks are simply opening. And then if you plot this uh, analysis, you can then uh, work out, depending upon whether the B value is increasing, then that's indicating you've got macro cracks. And when the B value is decreasing, uh, sorry, that's B value increasing is mac micro cracks, B value decreasing is macro cracks. And this basically was borne out by Sabrina's experimental work. So that was a, an interesting and useful piece of work. But going on to the uh, 
the title of the project of the uh, presentation today we were trying to estimate whether whether acoustic emission could be used for predicting the load carrying capacity of beams so Sabrina started to use the relaxation ratio and this is coming from earthquake uh, uh, sequences where you've got the the foreshock and where the foreshock equals the aftershock and then the aftershock is uh, uh, dominant and one is a loading situation and one is a relaxation situation and typically people have undertaken um, acoustic emission measurements on structures as they're loaded and what we were trying to do was to say well okay we'll do that but we'll also look at the emissions from the structure when it's being unloaded and if if you measured the emission in terms of the energy uh, from the structure then the relaxation ratio was defined as the average energy during the unloading phase divided by the average energy during the loading phase And this is uh, basically the procedure that Sabrina would follow. She would take the AE data, convert it into an ASCII file, and then calculate the relaxation ratio, either using Excel or MATLAB or, or whatever. And this is some, a summary of some of the uh, data. You know, you've got about five or six seconds to uh, simulate all this, but mm -hmm. perhaps what's uh, relevant is that uh, these are the beams we tested in Edinburgh um, and it's a fairly low strength concrete whereas the beams tested in Kumamoto were a much higher strength concrete uh, and also the beams in Kumamoto were uh, constructed using uh, rapid setting cement uh, I'm telling you that because you'll see in a few seconds that there's a discrepancy in the data we've got uh, most um, self-respecting researchers are proud to present data which uh, supports the argument so in this case uh, let me present the data which supports the argument and this is plotting relaxation ratio against the cycle number because we're cycling the load and in this case when the relaxation ratio was one then that was approximately 45 percent of the ultimate load carrying capacity of the beam now if you can if you can actually apply this to every beam then we're really making great progress but that's the question and that's the discrepancy which I'll show you so the next couple of slides will show you data which contradicts or fails to support this uh, this argument so I'm trying to be um, trying to be honest with you and open with you and show you that it was a risky project and that more works needed usually uh, we're criticized for asking for more funding because it's incremental but I think it's fairly critical that we uh, we try to win some money on this anyway basically if you're at a situation where you're monitoring a bridge under say traffic and you can uh, m measure that the relaxation ratio is one then you would know that your beam that you're monitoring is at 45 percent of the ultimate load and you could therefore make some prediction of the ultimate load if the re relaxation ratio is uh, less than one then clearly you're in a situation where the bridge is, has got a fair old margin uh, before it's going to fail and that's the kind of reassurance that the highway engineer in the UK the bridge engineer was looking for to get some reassurance that by keeping a, a damaged bridge open one that looks fairly degraded that m the Prime Minister's car at least wouldn't be on the bridge when it collapses you can see all the risks in life here can't you well then when you move to the next uh, set of data this is from the beams tested in Kumamoto then you see that the data has some trend but it really isn't as useful a trend uh, in the lower part of the graph below the relaxation ratio of one you've got the uh, world famous measles plot that we've seen in so many in areas of engineering be it concrete or be it uh, soil mechanics and uh, I come from a geotech background originally and when you look at triaxial testing of soils if you don't do it so uh, carefully you end up with the measles plot uh, so I'm well familiar with this plot now why, why have we got this situation of course that's half of Sabrina's PhD thesis trying to explain why it doesn't work in Kumamoto well part of it I guess was the fact that 
the concrete was perhaps stronger. We used uh, slightly different sensors, but we don't think that was relevant. And the loading rate uh, was faster in Kumamoto. So was it to do with the loading rate? Was it to do with the higher strength? And we, we can't give you a, a good answer on that question. So what we did then was to, uh, again, it's the Royal We. Sabrina does all the work, and I come here and stay in the hotel. Um, Sabrina then constructed uh, some extra beams, which were of higher strength, and she loaded them at the same rate as Kumamoto. And again, on, with only a small number of beams, she did get a scatter of data. So it's very clear that we haven't quite achieved our goal. The first set of results looked incredibly promising, but of course it's the old story of life. The more work you do, it perhaps doesn't help your argument. Uh, but that's life. We're, we're trying to be honest. So maybe the causes are due to due to the loading rate, maybe they're due to the uh, concrete properties. But we feel that at least there's the basis of uh, undertaking some further work. We also looked at um, uh, some other ratios, one called the calm ratio and one the load ratio. The load ratio is the load at the onset of acoustic emission activity and subsequent loads divided by the previous load. And the calm ratio is the number of cumulative AE activities during unloading divided by the total activity during the last loading cycle. And this is uh, basically following the work of Oates from Kumamoto University. And it's work that he's proposed to the Japanese Society for Non-Destructive Inspections. And he's saying that when the calm ratio is in this zone, you've got intermediate damage. When it's in this zone, you've got heavy damage. So Sabrina took some of her original work. This is one of her original beams. And in fact, the data that she got uh, when she did the calculations fell very nicely into the work that Oates has uh, proposed and incorporated into the Japanese uh, codes of practice. Uh, we also tried to work out on um, a composite bridge in Scotland. Uh, you, I'm a foreigner living in a foreign country. I'm English living in Scotland, so uh, uh, I can afford to uh, be uh, indiscreet at times. And the, the Scots are well known for being economical. Uh, there was a highway a couple of centuries ago that took horse-drawn traffic across the Masonry Arch Bridge that went in this direction. And then, probably in the 1950s, the highway engineer wanted to realign the road. So the logical thing would normally be to demolish the uh, masonry arch bridge and put up a, a, a concrete bridge, but uh, now that wasn't going to be the case. It was going to be more economical to leave the masonry bridge in position and put a small number of extra beams in and then put a deck on top of it. So you're making partial use of the masonry arch and partial use of these extra slabs. And there's no bonding between this concrete beam and the arch. So there you can see the new, relatively new beams, and there you can see the masonry arch. And the, the beam just simply is, is very in very close contact with the masonry arch. And if you look at it from the other side, uh, oh, sorry, down below you can see the, the other side of the bridge. And there that's basically a flat masonry arch bridge. It's, I'm afraid the photograph is not very clear there, but you're looking, that's the... Um, uh, the keystone on the vouzois where the pointer is and you can see through to the concrete. Um, so we spent some cold winter days with uh, our Japanese visitor Mitsuhiro Shigeishi and uh, Sabrina Colombo. Uh, from my point of view it seemed to be the, exactly the correct thing to do to take an Italian student who'd come to Edinburgh whose English was uh, not as good as it was eventually and take somebody from Japan who spoke almost no English and get the two of them to work together. And then I got them to share an office with a Glaswegian. Uh, nobody could understand the Glaswegian. Okay, so I mean, basically they, they were looking at this B-value analysis on the bridge and what they found was that they could detect some acoustic emission activity in the masonry but they didn't do enough work on it to, uh, to get any worthwhile data. So that's another project for another day. They got much better data with the um, uh, concrete beams, and they were able to identify that the concrete that looked to be in relatively good condition, in fact, was starting to degrade with microcracks. I'm not sure that the local authority engineer wanted to hear that message, but we told him anyway. Um, so... We came to the initial conclusion that acoustic emission is good at detecting ongoing deterioration in concrete. Um, 
and that the type of the, if you want to get into more detail, then you can use the moment tensor method. And Sabrina Colombo attempted to use the moment tensor method, but to be uh, honest, we didn't really get very far with that. Uh, the key conclusion was that the, uh, when the relaxation ratio is greater than one or, or round about one, then under certain conditions with the, the first set of beams we tested, we were at 45% of the ultimate bending load. But this it would be great if we could simply multiply by a factor of 2.2 to get to the ultimate bending load. But I think we haven't done enough uh, work to, uh, to, to, to say that uh, conclusively because we did find that the beams in Kumamoto with a different loading rate and a different concrete mix uh, gave us data that didn't support our Edinburgh data. So this is basically where we are. We think it's promising, but the results are obviously affected by the properties of the concrete and the, uh, the loading rate, and we do need to do more work on this. And can I uh, thank you for your patience and listening? And do we have any questions for Mike? Any questions? John? Why don't you come up to the mic? Yeah, come on up, thanks. I'm John Popovich from University of Illinois. Hi, Mike. Uh, Wondering what the loading uh, was in that uh, Scottish arch bridge. Was it just environmental conditions that drove the events that you've heard, or was there traffic? Or well, I think it's a combination of traffic and environment. So there was traffic on this? Oh, bridge. sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Quite a lot of traffic on it, yes. Any other questions for Mike? Any others? Well, thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Jim.